Um, for those of you who weren't in the original, the initial session this morning, um, that was not this morning, this afternoon, uh, just a couple minutes ago. Um, uh, I am Laura Pegram. I'm uh, the Associate Director of Drug User Health over here at NASDAQ. Um, and we thought this would be a really great opportunity to um, to use this space uh, at the Southern uh, Harm Reduction and SSP Institute to highlight a really unique and innovative project that um, NASDAQ and myself, well, myself, it, as NASDAQ um, and uh, other and CDC, uh, as well as um, some outside friends and consultants uh, worked on in the last um, two and a half years or so. Um, and so this, this project is really, um, you know, as you can tell, two and a half years is quite a long time. And, um, you know, really uh, just, the whole origin and aim for this project, I mean, we're really hoping to use today to kind of go through what we were thinking in terms of uh, needing um, resources that are needed to support syringe access programs across the country, um, especially as, as we are seeing just an ex exponential increase in growth in programs. Um, and uh, also, you know, really recognizing um, the expertise of the harm reduction community and people who have been running programs for a really, really long time. What we think of as sort of, I'll say, quote unquote, best practices um, for, for implementing, operating, creating, planning programs. Um, this was a project that had a lot of roadblocks um, and stumbling blocks, but we are so excited that um, our CDC partners, as well as our, our other uh, community, our other groups um, who helped contribute to it and individuals who helped contribute to it, um, uh, you know, had the, the staying power to see it to the end because it is, um, in my opinion, very, uh, could be very useful. And so uh, for programs trying to build support for new programs and uh, make the case for, for policy restrictions, removing policy restrictions that um, keep programs from operating in best practice. And really just, again, an opportunity to highlight like incredibly important, impactful work that um, has been going on and often has been um, unrecognized uh, by mainstream public health for, for many decades and years, right? Um, so uh, really just wanna like, first and foremost, uh, appreciate everyone uh, in the harm reduction community and the public health community who helped contribute to this. Um, I think overall, we probably had about 70 different contributors total. So um, really could not have done this without you and uh, just very, very, very grateful. Okay, so um, we'll just go ahead and jump in here and uh, I'm going to start with this very pretty image of the cover page. Um, if you can't tell, I'm very uh, proud of, this, of this, uh, this resource. I think it was a project that was so exciting to do and so exciting that it, it was finally released um, in, on Decem in December of 2020. Um, really just such a huge accomplishment for the harm reduction community. And I've already seen this, this resource being used in ways that are, um, in ways that are, uh, in ways that are, are useful um, for, in terms of the policy, in terms of program implementation. Um, so really just uh, so excited and, and appreciative here. Um, so we'll go just over here. So a little background, right? So the SSP technical package is what it eventually ended up being called. Um, we had toyed with the idea at first, we were gonna say it is, um, it was syringe service programs or harm reduction programs best practices or eventually we had also toyed with the language um, related to standards um, like operating standards and um, at the end of the day it seemed like the most straightforward way to package um, and eventually repackage this material and information that we got gathered from the harm reduction community was to what the cdc calls a technical um, and we'll kind of run through the different components of what a technical package is and how it can be used um, and, 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 you know, kind of go through the, you know, basically what we found in this project overall. Um, but really, when we think about this, we think about sort of best practices, effective strategies. So um, a little origin, you know, project background over here. Um, we know that in the last many, many years, especially since 2010, we've seen a three to five percent, three to five fold increase in hepatitis C across the country related to injection drug use. Um, other bacterial infections, including, you know, uh, you know, sepsis and, and including um, endocarditis, have increased um, markedly since 2010 as well. Um, 
we know that for many, many years, you know, uh, HIV related to infection drug use um, was kind of on the on the decline, um, and uh, you know, in recent years that has stalled um, because you know, obviously, uh, you know, just not making as much progress within within the community of people HIV prevention within the community of people who use drugs, um, and just really. Uh, you know, alarming increases um, in both overdose and um, injection related behavior in recent years. And so, um, you know, really seeing uh, this as being um, something that is an incredibly necessary, um, the increase of, of services for, for certain access programs across the country. Um, since 2014, we've seen nearly 100% increase in total number of programs right now. In 2015, we were sitting nationwide at about 200-ish programs. And I think some of the most recent surveys um, you know, have indicated that we're a bit over 400 at this point in time. And that's just exponential growth. I mean, just rapid growth of programs and programs popping up. And um, you know, I think some of the idea here was really to figure out how to work with those new programs and also work with, you know, programs that are a little storied and, and more, um, you know, pre-existing to really uh, try to share some of, of the knowledge that the harm reduction community has built up over the last 30 years um, related to uh, what actually makes you know, puts the heart in harm reduction, what actually makes programs operate, run, tick, um, and really, really effective and really so good at doing exactly what we know that they do so well, which is really reach and be a touch point for people who use drugs um, and getting access to services and creating spaces that, uh, creating spaces that, um, you know, humanize and destigmatize and, um, you know, find well, so what we were trying to do was basically just find ways to package some of that magic um, and ideally have it put into, you know, some sort of resource that would be widely available and, and useful um, and, uh, you know, really help new and pre-existing programs to tend their, uh, tend their program operations towards, um, you know, what we know to be effective, what we know to create that sort of um, that sort of uh, magic, right? And so you know, as we've seen these programs popping up all over the country, there's a huge variability in sort of where they're popping up um, in terms of is it local health departments, is it county health departments, is it community-based groups? Um, and so there's there's that sort of consideration um, because all of those programs look really wildly different. Um, and there is just a huge range of programs and policies um, that either support programs being created and operating within what we would think of as being really good programs or best practice um, or or those that create some barriers and challenges there. So really trying to get at the core of um, what it means to have really effective programming and share that information. Um, as you know, historically with programs as they popped up, often what we would, you know, where we'd end up in terms of um, you know, learning how to create harm reduction programs, a lot of that really came from other harm reduction programs and, and that sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning model, which is still absolutely there. Um, but we want to try to find a way to like bottle some of that information into this run. So there, you know, the, the concept in this origin, right, um, you know, raised some concerns um, from, from a lot of different communities, right, both from the public health community as well as um, from stake, some stakeholders in, in the harm reduction community for fear that if we if we put to something, put out, put out something, put something out there that's too prescriptive, that would actually maybe be counterproductive for programs, like create barriers for them to operate or un, uh, unrealistic expectations around data, unrealistic unre expectations around um, level or range of services. So we really wanted to, to guide this project into, you know, in, in some really like foundational philosophical um, principles, right? Um, we really just wanted to make sure that the way that we went about this uh, was holistic um, and really kind of going through, you know, at its core, what we were trying to get at um, was to really, you know, create an opportunity for, to, to recognize that Literally every jurisdiction has a need for syringe access programs, whether they want to admit it or not, right? So really creating a space saying, the CDC says, right? And, and you know, this, this project reinforces that um, 
we need to be proactive if we're going to actually prevent HIV and hepatitis among people who inject drugs. The syringe access programs are based in evidence and they are effective strategies, the most effective strategies um, to prevent HIV and hepatitis uh, among people who inject drugs. Um, the other, you know, the other idea here, um, and maybe like the most core, is that there is a huge variety and range of how syringe access programs look and syringe services programs look, um, and that there isn't a, a gold standard. There isn't a one size fits all, this is your Cadillac SSP, right? That all syringe access programs, all SSPs save lives. Even if they, the only thing they do is, you know, put out syringes and naloxone all syringe access programs save lives, right? And so recognizing that this is not about judging programs or grading programs, we didn't want to set up a system or any kind of, any kind of resource that would um, lead uh, a public health agency or anyone else to say, see, your program isn't perfect, right? Like your program isn't, you know, doesn't get 100% on the test, right? We wanted this to, to recognize that um, the origin for this project was really about, uh, you know, using this resource so that it would be, and creating this resource so it would be supportive and not punitive, um, never punitive, right? And that this, this resource should never, ever, ever be used to prevent a program from opening, nor to close one down. Again, trying to uh, address some of those concerns around like, what if you say this is a gold standard and then <laughs> a program can't do that because we don't give them money, right? Or they, you know, their, their community issues uh, as to why they couldn't do that. So really um, recognizing that we were just trying to make a resource that could be widely useful um, and, and help align, uh, help programs align themselves with best, best practice. Um, and uh, yeah, and that felt at the time, I remember feeling like oh, that's, a, that's a lot to take on. Um, and there's totally a way to do it because we know that these program, you know, the, the, these programs are um, based in evidence and we are, you know, always trying to be creative about building support um, for the programs themselves and, and figuring out how, what kind of tools and resources we want um, and need to, in order to do that. So um, the whole point here was to really um, do what we've kind of been talking around is really this idea of kind of taking this 30 years of strong evidence, empirical evidence uh, behind programs that we have, both in internationally and domestically, we have all of this evidence, right? And really, really carrying this evidence around sort of uh, best practices and program design, implementation, all of that, um, and then finding a, a different, more like qualitative type of type of um, type of evidence, right? So really, uh, you know, type of data. So taking, um, taking, you know, sort of pairing that, that qualitative, I'm sorry, quantitative um, empirical literature with, you know, qualitative data, um, really getting the opportunity to talk to a variety of folks um, across the country who work in a variety of different syringe access programs or harm reduction roles related to harm reduction um, about how you know how they put the magic in their programs why their programs are incredibly effective how they approach the work how they approach um creating and implementing and sustaining the work and so uh really that was like the whole core concept here is is having sort of this qualitative approach um paired with paired with um you know the more what puts the kind of art in harm reduction right um and so uh we also you know in thought it would be incredibly useful to have this be a CDC branded resource and branded document um, as that carries a lot of weight um, and a lot of it provides a lot of um, you know back, backing to the validity of this resource and syringe access programs in general um, which is is so so I mean making <laughs> um, you know but this is this is really uh, you know an exciting place that we're at in terms of federal support for syringe access programs and recognition of syringe access programs so I just want to be appreciative of that and grateful of that. So the whole point here was really to you know again create this resource that's going to articulate evidence around syringe access programming um, and and you know uh, at the end of the day, I mean, really what we want is for this to improve service delivery, right? To make our services better, more accessible um, to folks who are using drugs in our communities. Um, we really, again, back to the supportive, not punitive, we really wanted this to be a resource that could be looked upon as a source of validation for different program models and different programs as they operate. 
And at the end of the day, we landed on five larger buckets of effective strategies and approaches um, that syringe access programs can adopt or, or work towards, tend toward, towards, um, to be more in alignment with overall best practices from the field. So um, in, 2000, in late 2018, uh, NASDAQ was awarded uh, CDC funding to undertake this project. Um, we wanted to make sure, given NASDAQ working primarily with health departments as well as community-based groups, that this would be useful to all different levels of stakeholders, um, both health departments, CBOs, advocates, people who are trying to run programs, start programs. Um, we decided to, we wanted to develop a process for community feedback and input, like I said, sort of the qualitative elements of this, talking to people who have been running programs for a long time, or some who have been running programs for less time, um, and still have really programs that are renowned as, as, as good, really effective programs, right? So, and in order to do that, we really needed to convene um, stakeholders in a variety of different ways um, to kind of get some of get at some of the heart and sort of qualitative, um, you know, how to get that feedback into what makes really effective programs. Um, we served as kind of a go-between. Um, we we worked with Katie Burke and Shelley Vicente um, uh, and Vicente Consulting, who are uh, operate out of um, California, San Francisco area, to actually be the primary consultants who are who are doing the the groundwork on this project um, and creating the original drafts of it um, and and that was uh, the whole project was done with a lot of collaboration between our CDC team NASDAQ, and these and, and our two consultants there too um, and eventually others as well in fact I, I do believe that we have um, Alice Asher on the call here today and I'll just recognize her and call her out because I think this was really her brainchild and she was like kind enough to trust NASDAQ with, with this project um, and has been tenacious in, in supporting it throughout the years of getting it through clearance and um, just really want to call that out and appreciate that. It's welcome to chime in at any point if she wants. Um, and then, you know, we really, uh, you know, obviously want to have this feel useful um, moving forward. So we're trying to, since it was just released in December, we're really trying to figure out the ways that um, we can be productive um, and, and make this resource as widely valuable, useful, meaningful for you all who are working in programs or health departments on the ground. Um, so excited to think forward from this point forward about, uh, you know, what technical assistance around um, this project really looks like and uh, really tracking some of the ways that it's being used already in communities. Um, you keep keep that nugget in your, you know, in your brain, um, because that might be sort of, I think, where we'll end up in terms of the discussion uh, at the end of this, uh, you know, sort of overview, right? Okay. All right. So here's how we, you know, just general overview of what we were thinking, right? So um, we did a general literature review. Um, overall, at the end of the day, we, we cited 64 distinct studies supporting different aspects of harm reduction programs and program best practices. Um, looked at many, 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 many more. Um, we again had these conversations with community stakeholders. Um, these were unstructured primarily, uh, you know, really not like any scripted sort of thing, really just looking, you know, talking to um, a diverse range of stakeholders, um, you know, in terms of geographic diversity, program size, urban, rural, um, you know, population served, really tried to get a pretty broad, um, a pretty broad conversation, you know, sort of stakeholder, you know, uh, yeah, I guess stakeholder is the word, um, community stakeholder uh, representation for, for syringe access programs. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we had 15 or 16 of these unstructured conversations um, that were recorded um, and uh, transcribed and then coded into, you know, different sort of topic areas, things that were coming up and, you know, in terms of thematic uh, similarities across the, you know, across the, the conversations. Um, and we'll see some quotes that we were eventually able to include as well um, in the final product, which is, again, really, really exciting because I love qualitative research and makes a lot of, um, really drives home a lot of the things that uh, it's hard to capture in, in academic studies, right? 
Um, and then we also, another way of gathering this data, this input, was we had an in-person stakeholder meeting, um, again, of uh, diversity of representation between public health and syringe access programs, folks who have been doing this for a really long time, or supporting this for a really long time um, in DC. And that was, yes, in 2019, um, which uh, was, I mean, a really, a really, you know, very exciting meeting and, um, you know, got into a lot of, a lot of the meat of, of sort of what success looks like in programs and what makes a program um, effective and, and good. And uh, yeah, so so really just trying to really diversify the ways that we were gathering data for this project um, was, was our thought here. Um, so I was editing this timeline. I presented on this once before, before it was published. Um, and uh, the timeline had to be adjusted pretty substantially. So initially this was planned to be a one year project. <laughs> One year project and um, starting in sort of January 19, 2019, even though it was awarded in 2018, it took us a minute to identify the right people to work with. Um, so, literature review um, sort of was the first step there, really doing um, some of that, that just general, like finding the empirical research, finding what the evidence says. Um, moving into that year, the informant conversations, the stakeholder meeting, and still in April 2019. And then our consultants were able and, and this team was able to create a draft of the what we were calling SSP standards or best practices at that point in time. And we submitted that to the CDC uh, in in a form you know that we were we were pleased with um, you know into the approval process uh, in in the summer of 2019. And well, then it took a while, <laughs> um, and we, we anticipated that this would be a challenge. Um, we anticipated that this would be a pretty steep hill to climb, um, and that there, you know, even with the increasing um, increased support from our federal partners around syringe access programs, we all know that these are just really, I mean, absurdly controversial for no reason at all, and um, should not be. And it's still, you know, it's it's challenging um, to, uh, you know, get things. Actually, I'll just say this, it's challenging to get most anything through the CDC clearance process. And we knew that anything that had the word syringe um, might face some extra scrutiny, right? Um, so part of the, the reason that it took so long um, to kind of go through the process is that we had originally drafted it to look a certain way that made sense to us. And, you know, and then we learned that there were um, a lot of semantics around, you know, challenges that when we call something standards or best practices, that those actually um, mean a different thing for federal partners uh, and federal agencies around how it's formatted and structured. So we had to kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, our CDC partners really helped us work through and helped redraft um, this and kind of re, re, jigger this a little bit into what is known as a technical packet, um, which there are others, uh, many others, you know, uh, largely from injury prevention um, at the CDC. And so it just, it, it's about structure and formatting, not so much about content. Um, I, I was always so grateful and excited to, to hear from CDC partners that like, actually it's nothing about the, like what we found or what we're saying is best practice, it's really just the structure. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you know, some, what we found was just so exciting. Um, and things that you all who are running programs, you know, you know these are best practices, right? Um, and so the idea that we, there was a really good chance that we were gonna get a CDC logo stamp on, on this project that, you know, reinforces some of the real intuitive basic things we know about harm reduction and what makes programs work, like hiring people who use drugs and, you know, not having a one-for-one -one exchange really, really exciting. And I was, you know, always so grateful, so grateful um, to be to be helping to, you know, uh, uh, what I'll say, shepherd that through. Um, and again, so grateful to our CDC partners. Um, for that through. Um, so I'm just gonna put the picture there again, because I still really like looking at it. Um, this is listed on the CDC website. This is eventually, you know, sort of how it looks and where we landed on that. And we're gonna spend the rest of the time here today um, kind of just walking through the different uh, strategies um, and, and the different approaches that are included in the technical package. And then um, 
really, you know, hoping to spend a little bit of discussion time or any chat time um, around uh, potential ways that you could see using such a thing or strategies around, um, you know, how to get this out into community and in, you know, broader utility, so that there's broader utility for, for the resource. So, um, yes, as, like I said, eventually we landed on a technical package um, of effective strategies and approaches for planning, design, and implementation. Um, and this, uh, you know, the, the reformulation of this, um, like I said, was uh, largely conducted by the CDC part, our CDC partners, um, somewhat myself, myself, um, as well as um, a CDC health fellow, I don't, who was, who was, Sort of on detail with the, with our CDC partners for about six to nine months, and so he 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 helped you know kind of create that first draft, and then we all worked on it from there. So really grateful for all these folks um, who have contributed to this resource. Okay, Whew. what did we learn? Um, okay, come on. So uh, as mentioned, there were eventually we we created the original the original draft that we had i think had seven different categories of, of effective strategies and we were able to combine some of these down spill them down into five overall and so like i said we're gonna we're gonna kind of walk through these one by one but effective strategies and approaches the five effective strategies and approaches that are included in the final product here um number one involve people who use drugs in programming um involve people who use drugs in programming. Um, so often you hear from new health department, you know, help, I mean, from new programs starting up or health programs, particularly those who, um, that are being started and don't uh, have a great relationship pre-existing with people who use drugs, like, well, you know, a lot of new programs get started being very far removed from community, um, similar to the conversation we were having this morning. And, and really, you know, uh, some programs are started, you know, and, and you know, kind of approach the philosophy of what how they do the work in a very almost paternalistic way or a way that's like we're helping you you're, you're not a part of us you know sort of separate so this one i mean to have a cdc logo on on on, on a resource where the first concept is work with people who use drugs ask people who use drugs recognize that they are experts is i will say groundbreaking innovative um unprecedented and and just so excited that it's out there in the world right um, second strategy, so really thinking through different um, elements related to SSP planning, design, implementation, um, and we'll go into that in more detail. So the third strategy was really this idea of like, what makes an SSP and then what, like, what, what is the, you know, what, what is the, what is the milk and what's the cream, right? And well, maybe that's not the right metaphor, but you know, the idea of like, what, what does an SSP offer and need to offer in order to be, to save lives, right? Um, and so exciting to kind of talk through, you know, what else can it offer that would um, be value add, but shouldn't be a barrier to a program opening, right? Um, if you don't have all those extra services, talking through that. Um, we have a whole section about sort of ideal data collection um, and innovative ways that folks have uh, creatively nav navigated data collection overall. Um, and then obviously program sustainability is a thing that you know, is just, I mean, a common, all too common challenge for um, people who, for programs operating on the ground. Um, we know that the funding streams for syringe access programs, um, as well as support for syringe access programs in communities um, can be, you know, unstable and, and often, um, you know, kind of, kind of come and go with the wind, right? Um, so uh, really having a whole section just focused um, just focused on, uh, you know, how, how to build sustainable programs, because we know that, you know, these programs need to be part of essential public health and part of communities and not just for a short term, um, that these are programs that we want to have around for, for forever, right? They're going to be essential for forever. Okay, and again, feel free to keep uh, adding uh, any questions into the chat um, if you if you want you know, me to pause. Uh, we do have folks, other folks who are um, monitoring the chat, and so they can always jump in as well if, if I'm going too fast or skipping over anything, okay? So the one I really, just strategy one, involve people who use drugs. In the technical package, it's a slight longer heading and title, but really, that's just what it is. Involve people who use drugs, right? That 
and not just in a you know not just in a a role that is um related to an outreach worker or a peer or anything like that but in all aspects of program right program design implementation when you're creating it how you're evaluating it who's on your board um really and then really thinking about oh sorry this other idea of like creating a uh, meaning like a real diversity of how of like opportunities for for people who use drugs and who are participants in your program to contribute um, and that, you know, there's not just like this one size fits all sort of thing, right? Um, and so this is really, really exciting. And so, um, so the technical package, each strategy has approaches under it. And then the approaches uh, kind of have some key takeaways that are takeaways that are both from the empirical literature, which is cited um, in like bullet points, and then try to distill them down into sort of like here are, the, here are the cliff notes of what you want to know about this. And then it also includes some qualitative, um, you know, some real words from the conversations that we had with people who are running really good programs all across the country. So um, by including some of the qualitative things, we were able to really get some of that, you know, capital H, capital R harm reduction philosophy into you know an approach and strategy and heart into this resource so we're gonna just spend some time walking through so the takeaways um like i said involve all participants in all aspects of program uh design implementation um really finding creative ways as programs to um, empower and provide thoughtful support to all participants and gather feedback in a way that is not tokenizing that is meaningful um that we are being held accountable to that um, Again, similar to what we were saying, sort of the, the different levels of, um, you know, ways that participants can be, uh, can be incorporated, hired, you know, on the board, different, different types of engagement, um, really, really important. Um, and, you know, a real recognition that harm reduction was created by people who use drugs. The first programs, all the programs, the really good programs, harm reduction was created by people who use drugs, who wanted to take care of themselves. And so this real, um, it's really, really necessary um, for, for new programs and programs in particular who maybe don't come, you know, weren't created or incorporate initially people who use drugs in their programs, that there's so much expertise there. Um, and really just committing to, uh, to creating programs and committing to learning from our participants, right? Um, really, really incredibly foundationally important to good programming. Uh, and yeah, just really acknowledging that like expertise is in the room, um, that quite often when we are creating programs, it's like we are just, we are the vehicle to help, uh, you know, get people what they need, um, but people know what they need, and you know, when they need it, and it's not our place to be telling them anything, right? Um, okay. <laughs> um, so I did just put up, for many of these, I put up in the technical package, there's, this is the section that's related to um, the sort of what we heard from folks running really good programs, right? And I'm not gonna read through all of these, but I highly encourage you to go and check out the technical package or review this because I put pretty much all of them there. Um, but there's, there's just a couple here that I wanna highlight. And it's gonna be hard to not say some of these names. We, we left them sort of anonymous um, or based on jurisdiction um, and whether that this program and the person operating it is running sort of a community-based program or a health department-based program. And uh, yeah, just so, so much valuable heart and nuggets here. Um, oh, yeah, um, so I, just, I, wanna, I wanna call out two of these and read them, right? So listen to drug users, your participants, they're participants, they are not fans. They're definitely not patients. And as, a, and as participants, they should be part of your decision-making process. Have them as part of your board, have them as a part of your decision-making, even if it's making sure you are constantly asking your participants what's working and what's not. That's like base level, right? Um, in terms of, of sort of engaging with folks, right? Oh, and this is actually, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna skip down to the bottom one because I just, I, I love um, the way that this person centers um, participants as, as um, sort of the idea of peer and addresses this idea of, of peer, um, which is often can be, a, can be turned into a role that is relegated to just being an outreach worker, just being a peer, right? Um, but I love how this person says, I wanna be very clear that peer is not a position 
a level of a position in an organization, peer or peer educator, being a peer drug user, post drug user is a vantage point. This person often says it's a lens, right? Or positioning that makes this person have this person has via the drug use, sex work, homelessness, whatever, here's a vantage point, not a position. Um, and, you know, he, this person feels very strongly about this. Um, you know, peers are seen as sometimes the lowest position, like an outreach, you know, uh, lowest position a peer, and then you graduate to being an outreach worker and a coordinator. And it's like, no, you know, peers are every level of this, like an outreach worker with a peer perspective. Hopefully someday we'll have a peer executive director. And there are many peer executive directors, quote unquote, um, and just really recognizing that, you know, so much about the philosophy behind these programs and why they work is really empowerment and strength based, um, recognizing the power and uh, voice that, that people have. Um, there you go, Morgan. Morgan is a peer ED. <laughs> I love it. I'm just like randomly looking at the chat, but I, I really just like very much appreciate the idea that peer as a lens. Um, and that there's, you know, your participants have all the answers, right? Um, so just finding the ways to really leverage some of these, um, these reflections from, from leaders in the field, um, I think is really useful. And again, I, I, CDC who's on the call is not upset, but this, this is a CDC little document. Um, and this carries weight in a way that I just uh, am so grateful for, right? So yeah, okay, so moving on to strategy two. Um, so thinking about overall SSP planning, design, implementation. Um, here's another one that's, until this was released, never been put out uh, in, a, in a CDC stamp document um, that needs-based distribution, i.e. not one-for-one, one, is best practice. Giving people as many materials as they need to have you know, sterile equipment for every injection is best practice. Um, the program delivery model and design should be informed by ongoing needs assessment and sort of the need and the same to our communities, right, to our participants, to our, to our folks. Um, uh, really uh, highlighting the importance of partnerships and diverse stakeholders groups, sort of similar to our, our panel earlier today. Um, or it's really vital to successful implementation and adoption of, of programs. Um, and that, you know, People who use, sorry, SSPs are these wonderful places. In fact, why the CDC calls them SSPs, syringe services programs, is that they really provide that platform, that touch point for a lot of potential other services outside of just a syringe, right? Um, but the syringe is the really vitally important, you know, sort of that is the, the you know, one of, <laughs> that is the thing, right? Um, but, you know, the, the, these are really, really exciting opportunities to think about linkages to care, about more comprehensive case navigation or participant navigation, um, service navigation, and um, really thinking strategically about what can be possible in, in a program. Um, also hearing like earlier on the panel, Donald is talking about how, you know, since COVID there's a real need for showers and hand washing stations and things like that. So um, I think that that's an important point that this is always uh, evolving as well. So takeaways. <laughs> um, so this is where we kind of get into that like what's core versus we'll we'll touch on very briefly here what's core and what's um you know sort of what's additional right what's sort of the cream or the icing right um and so that you know syringe distribution and disposal op disposal options are essential um that if you're going to be an ssp you need to you know put out their syringe services like syringes um, and disposal options and we were careful here um, to mention that this is disposal disposal options um, as opposed to disposal on site um, and again this is sort of this is a great uh, sort of way to highlight some of the some of the really challenging conversations I think that we had um, as a project team uh, worrying that if we said you know, syringes and disposal on site are requirements, right, that, that could be weaponized in certain places. So there are a lot of small scrappy SSPs that don't necessarily have the money or the resources or the site to store all that biohazard, right? And it's perfectly legal in basically every U.S. state to dispose of syringes in your household waste, right? Like there are options and avenues. So we had this, conver you know, sort of example of how we had this conversation and really trying to think very holistically around um, potential impact and trying to really make sure that we were creating something that could not be um, and hopefully will never be used to weaponize 
um, or, or threaten a program. Again, trying to just be as supportive as possible, as broad as possible, but also as specific as possible to really get programs in alignment with best practice. Um, and yet, then there were lots of conversations like that. It was a very interesting, fascinating um, project overall um, in terms of that uh, being really, in terms of the level of thoughtfulness that came from the NASDAQ team, our consultants, the CDC folks at, at all different levels. I, and I'm grateful, grateful. Um, so again, needs-based distribution, recommended syringe, syringe distribution practice, um, definitely the most effective way to prevent infectious disease, right? Um, programs uh, should create services that are incredibly low threshold or as low threshold as is possible, um, that this is a best practice, right? Um, ensuring confidentiality, ensuring, you know, that there's not a huge administrative burden on programs or on participants, recognizing that those create barriers. Again, this has never been put into a stamped CDC document, right? Um, so it now carries a lot of weight and I've heard how it carries weight. Um, also, the idea of secondary syringe uh, exchange, right? Um, secondary exchange in communities, again, best practices. Um, and figuring out how to meaningfully, you know, when you were thinking about designing a program, how are we getting information from our participants about what they want and what they need, and sizes, ages, all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's also this conversation that, that happened here around um, SSPs really. Uh, Again, not being a, a one size fits all, but you know what, that extends the idea of, of communities of people who use drugs and inject drugs, right? That like there's not just like this monolithic community of injection drug users or people who inject drugs, right? That each community might inject drugs very differently and have cultures that are very different, drugs that are very different, um, groups of administration and community around that, and recognizing that um, there's really no way to just have this prescriptive here's the model, right? We really need to have programs that are tailored to community needs. Um, and yeah, um, again, sort of looking towards, uh, you know, what it means in terms of uh, sustainability, in terms of diverse stakeholders, um, really, really important there. Um, and that's related throughout. Um, why is this? Sorry. Oh, so sorry. I think it's not letting me move. It's okay. Um, yeah, and then also, you know, really uh, looking and being aware of the range of services that um, people uh, and participants might want and need and how to build support and referrals and on-site care, linkages, things like that. Um, all important in terms of best practice to building up a program. Okay, so let's see which one we want to try to highlight here. Um, Let's see, so there were so many here, uh, and I again I encourage everyone to just read this whole thing, it's really so touching. Um, down here, you know, in, in Vermont, this is a, this is a really good one. Um, you know, this, this program is, is, hasn't been around that terribly, terribly long compared to some of the other programs we talked to, um, but they have a really just model, model, um, you know, uh, operation and really are just so good at, at linking people to care. So. Um, you know, and being reflective about how they show up in community and build those relationships. So um, this person says, I get that in some places, the only way to do syringe access at all is one for one exchange. And in those places, places that's definitely better than nothing. But I think as soon as there's a, like a little window to push away from that, right, when the sky doesn't fall, we all need to be focused on getting away from those practices that can be so damaging. Everyone has to be in the mindset that you are settling because of these constraints and you can't do anything about them. And the second that you're able to push, even if it's a year or two later, you've had some successes, you're able to say, remember, before you were skeptical, but look what we're doing, right? Look how well we're doing. Um, you have to constantly strive to be pushing that, that envelope, right? Um, be addressing policies that are restrictive and not aligned with best practices. Um, and I also love this comment, this reflection from the folks in New Mexico, um, you know, that, that they used to do a one-for-one -one exchange plus, right? Um, and, and after a while, they switched to negotiated exchange, right? Um, and they had to change regulation in order to do this. And this is actually from a public health coordinator, so a state-level coordinator who doesn't run programs, but is tasked with, um, tasked with supporting programs, right? Um, and New Mexico is really model in this way. They do this really, really well. 
So you see they changed a the regulation um, and they still encourage syringes to be returned, obviously. Um, but what they found is that before, when they were doing the one for one exchange, what would occur is that people would try to come up with ways of scamming the system to get what they needed. Um, that they were basically encouraging people to be dishonest about what they needed. And then they wouldn't talk with us about the other things going on, other barriers or issues they were having. This was the real problem, right? Now people are being much more honest with us and not just about syringes, but about other things because it's not, because it's not just about that talking, but having additional communication. Um, and that's really, you know, the relationship is the core and the heart of these programs. And, and we know that that's, you know, so much of why they work, right? Um, and so really kind of getting to that and recognizing that um, how our impacts, like how policies in states or within programs can really affect our, you know, how uh, the power dynamics, the boundaries, the, the, you know, how we are able to interact meaningfully with participants, right, um, and with, with these communities. So, uh, so, so, so important to note um, and also note the, the different levels that this health department was able to sort of change policy to make programs, make it so that programs could run better, right? Ooh, right. Strategy three, core versus expanded services. Um, this was one that we absolutely had a lot of conversation around, a lot of fruitful conversation around um, at, at many, many different levels, because we do think of syringe access programs as being this incredible place for services, incredible place as a touch point for people to use drugs. They're literally a, an alternative form of medical system and care that was created by people who felt so deeply disenfranchised from a different one, right, from the mainstream medical care, that it's important to, to think about what feels possible in terms of services there, um, but then what is also essential in order to get, you know, be thinking that this is a syringe, you know, considered a syringe access program to essential to be recognized as that touch point, right? So, at a really basic level, this is what we can't, this is what we landed on, right? That syringe distribution and safe disposal education are considered core services. Expanded services, all the range of ex services um, comp can complement, um, can be present, can be there. We encourage them to be there, but they're a complement to the core services, right? The, the first bullet here, syringe distribution, safe disposal, this is the cake, the rest is the icing. You know, the things that feel like could be an add-on, but you can't get there without, the, you know, you can't have a full delicious cake without the first one, right? Syringes, safe disposal education. Um, and, and really thinking um, very broadly about what feels possible. I, I know we were unable to think of every potential thing that feels possible um, in terms of uh, a broader continuum of care services that were able to be offered. Um, but of course, thinking about naloxone, thinking about um, HIV, hepatitis screening, thinking about vaccinations, and now in COVID, this has changed the game entirely, thinking about different types of testing, vaccination, um, access to care, housing, referrals, and um, also MAT, you know, MOUD, um, you know, medications, uh, you know, because we know that that is one of the most effective overdose prevention um, interventions. Um, and uh, yeah, we know that, that it's a thing that we, we want to see more of. And again, this is just important in terms of link, you know, being that touch point uh, for participants and communities. Okay, so takeaways. Um, like we just said, uh, distribution, disposal, core. Everything else, icing. Um, and important icing, delicious icing. Um, that syringe dis distribution needs to be needs-based, ideally. Um, high quality and non-retractable syringes. Donald Davis mentioned that earlier today, um, but those retractable syringes are just, they tear up veins and they're really, uh, yeah, just really awful um, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the harm reduction efforts related to um, uh, taking tests for going slow and doing virtual injections. So, um, not best practices there, even though some programs try to advocate, some policymakers try to advocate for them as in, going down the logic rabbit hole of if they retract, then people can't reuse the syringe. Um, and you can always find a way to uh, reuse that syringe. People are very creative at doing that. And um, again, kind of tears up veins and not great in terms of overdose prevents, prevention. Um, so thinking about disposal options on site, um, and if these are not if it's not possible, thinking about education about how safe disposal at home or other disposal options, um, 
including naloxone distribution and training wherever that is possible, having that be as low barrier and going to participants as opposed to um, prioritizing other community stakeholders like law enforcement or, or public health, I'm um, sorry, not public health, um, law enforcement or um, EMS, that sort of thing, really uh, recognizing the the people who reverse the most overdoses are people who use drugs um, and the people you're using with. So uh, just important to, to drive that home. This is another thing that's highlighted in this resource. Um, really recognizing that expanded services are amazing. And you know we want to have as many possible options um, and offered there as, as is possible. Um, but, that they, but that if programs can't have those, it's not a reason to think that they're a bad program. Um, you know, it is just a reason to, to assess what kind of resources they might need or interest they might have um, in being creative about getting access to those, those services as well. Again, so um, including infectious disease and MAT. Um, and, you know, really recognizing that the more services um, that can be couched or relationships that we can build with other uh, community agencies, um, you know, with the SSP and them or couching their services within the SSP, that this creates opportunities for sustainability um, and, and, you know, ongoing relationships um, so that those are, you know, uh, so that those are, are long-term um, and uh, might even lead to some potential funding opportunities as well. Okay, <laughs> so again, I just put up a, a few of these here. I'm going to choose, think through which ones I'd like to highlight here. Um, I love this, this Utah um, quick one, the start small, don't try to conquer the world, um, do what you can, focus on strengthening process and your procedures, really getting at that concept of, you know, you don't have to, like, you don't have to have everything on day one. Don't like let it be a barrier to starting because you're not sure that you have, you know, every referral source lined up or, you know, you know, everything, all of the ducks in a row. It's much more important to just get those syringes out there to get the program started to, to start doing the work and then build it up. Right. Um, again, folks from from Vermont. Right. Uh, so this this program has um, MAT uh, on site um, and, and low barrier. So they say it's really nice to be able to offer people treatment. Um, they have low barrier treatment and, and it, with low barrier, they're not getting discharged for poly substances. So they feel really, so they really feel like we're hanging in there with them. And if they show up at 4 p.m. for a 2 p.m. appointment, of course we still see them. It's really the way it should be. So thinking about how we bring harm reduction philosophy and approach that relationship to other services that we're providing is really, really great too, right? Um, I love this, this uh, program here in West Virginia. This is a very successful health department run program um, and really uh, has done so much work to do the community assessment stuff, right? To really uh, keep aligned as, as, as much as they can uh, with what their community needs, right? So you have to look at your community and what's going on. What's the real problem you need to solve? It can't be one size fits all. In one community, what you really need to be working on is academic detailing for prescribers or some way to limit the prescriptions without sudden cessation. And what we're pretty convinced drive, we're pretty convinced drives people to inject in drug use. So um, opioid prescriptions. You've got that problem, then you might not have as much of an injection problem. You might have more need of support to enter drug treatment, or maybe you need more testing, linkage to care services. Maybe you need telemedicine for MAT. What will best serve your county? I mean, this is really like the, the constant thoughtfulness um, and creativity and adaption, adaptivity, no, <laughs> adaptiveness uh, that, that this program has. has all good programs, right? They need to be sensitive to the changing trends and needs of community. Um, and uh, I think that that, you know, kind of runs throughout um, and hopefully can, you know, be taken in terms of programs and doing work for a really long time and maybe haven't revisited, you know, their community needs in a minute. Um, that is relatively common and so important to kind of constantly be in contact there uh, and keeping a, you know, finger to the pulse of of what's going on in the community and needs. Okay, strategy four, data. <laughs> um, you know, there, there is certainly, um, you know, I'll speak for state health departments and, and local health departments. Um, sometimes, you know, there are like there's legislation that's passed or new new programs are starting up and um, I can sometimes see, you know, health department staff, like their eyes light up and they're like, there's so much we could, and it's like, yes, and the point of the, 
programs, the terrain access programs, is not necessarily about what we can learn from people who use so that's a welcome side effect, side, you know, benefit, but um, really about the services first, right? So how do we strike this balance between like hit that sweet spot of what is enough data and how are the ways that we're um, being creative and collecting it and making sure that that data create barriers to services um, for, for folks who, who are using the program, right? So um, sort of approaches here that certain, that SSP should collect data on trends and needs and overall program effectiveness, um, particularly thinking about like, how are we gauging, you know, our performance? Are we reaching the people we want to be reaching? Are we doing enough? Are we out there enough, right? Um, and that data should be sufficient to meet needs and never a barrier to service delivery. Never a barrier to service delivery, right? That should never ever stand in the way there. Um, again, this is not stuff, the, you know, these are things that programs know um, quite often, um, and it's not written anywhere, right? This is, you know, this is a, again, sort of a new, a brand new thing, like tool that we can use, resource we can use to build, tend our programs towards best practice. Um, okay, so here we are with our takeaways. Um, that data collection is essential to inform whether our program is doing what we wanted to do. Um, you know, it should, um, you know, really be reliant, uh, you know, in terms of uh, reliable data, sorry, reliance on the local knowledge, landscape, all of that, gathering data from participants is really, really important to make sure we're doing what we want to see at the end of the day, right? Um, that effort should be made to collect reliable data on demographics, services, trends, um, that data collection should be minimal, <laughs> as minimal as possible, and always serve a purpose, like, uh, you know, Sometimes you hear people wanting to ask all kinds of things just because they're really interested. And that probably comes from a place of really good intentions. And um, always make sure that whatever data we're asking for has a direct, you can say, I'm asking for this because. And be able to say that to our participants, right? be able to say that um, because it's really, really important um, to, you know, shield participants and programs from um, unnecessary data collection or uh, in involvement and in research, that sort of thing, um, you know, very, very important there, which we touched on in the first panel. Um, and that there are also, you know, a lot of um, opportunities to collect data in creative ways, and it doesn't always just have to be like one intake form and then a quarterly report, that kind of thing, um, that there, there are many different models, which is gone into, into, the, into the resource um, about how to be creative around data collection, right? Um, and making sure that we are, especially doing also the community level sort of assessments and making sure that um, we aren't overlooking large portions of our community in terms of needs and services and such. Oof. All right, so um, yeah, I love it. North Carolina, here we are in the South, right? We've got a lot of South in here. Um, we want people to be able to walk in and out within 60 seconds if they want. So we're really focused on making sure that any information we're collecting is worthwhile. But there's a point. We want we don't want people to have to feel burdened with having to give up anything extra we honestly don't need. Um, you know, this North Carolina program typically <laughs> thinks, you know, uh, looks at data from like number in, number out. Um, you know, it just it's like very, you know, number of people you're helping and you know, secondary exchanging with, right? Um, so really thinking about what is the bare minimum we need in order to um, meet our funders requirements um, as well as you know just making sure there's no barrier to services there um oh okay kentucky this one this one's all south uh florida and kentucky so uh the the health department um ssp coordinator for the state at the time uh really goes into you know what success looks like right it's not just like numbers of people linked referred treated all of that in harm reduction she indicates, right, that there are so many levels of success. That if someone says, I used to use heroin and now I use marijuana, that's a success story. I got into care, I got my kids back, success story. <laughs> Since I have to be at work at eight, I've learned to get up an hour earlier so I can use and still get to work on time and not get fired. Everything is a success story. Um, there are so many different angles and vantage points for, for the participants who are coming in. All of this is success. And I think that that really gets to this idea of how we are how we are noting progress and how harm reduction is really good at noting progress and working with people to build upon strengths and really adopt that strengths-based approach. 
Whew, okay, we're almost done, I promise. <laughs> uh, so the last strategy, right, sustainability. I feel like I present on funding and sustainability all the time. Um, so the general approaches, so is really about, just like our first panel, um, really looking at a variety of stakeholders um, and building those relationships to uh, diversify support and, and offer potential options for both financial and social support um, for, you know, within communities. That this, that diverse web of community stakeholders and engagement is really vitally important um, and a process, an ongoing process. Um, that outreach, uh, you know, can definitely build support and program sustainability, uh, you know, in terms of visibility of the program and making it uh, sort of humanizing the program, making it very relatable. Um, and it also, you know, can, can help address some of, if, you're, if your community is having sort of syringe litter issues or complaints, really uh, thinking about outreach, you know, being very present in terms of community cleanups and um, just, you know, very uh, responsive to community needs and concerns, right? Oh, funding. Everyone who runs a program or works in a program has used a program. Everyone knows that funding for strength access programs is incredibly challenging um, and we have to get really creative and all the health department people on the line know that they're, they're just, there's this really complicated web and uh, braid of how we have to approach funding for programs and, um, I wish it were less complicated. I'm hopeful in the future it will be less complicated, but that funding and diversity in funding um, is really, really vitally important for program sustainability, right? Um, and, you know, building support for programs can look a variety of different ways. Um, and I think that that's important to kind of really recognize here as well um, that like, it's not this us, you know, like here's the syringe access program, the people who use drugs, and then there's like the community that people who use drugs are the community. This program is part of the community, right? And it's important to build that sense, shared sense of purpose around what these programs can do and how, you know, they just recognize that they are really an essential part of this. Yeah, okay, so um, this is a little redundant, but partnerships, um, key, uh, really, really important, both financially and you know, socially um, within communities. So um, being creative about the different types of stakeholder groups and partners we're, we're building up, support we're building up, um, that's both in terms of funding and again, social support. Um, yeah, um, health departments play a unique role. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of, again, like thinking about the New Mexico director, um, you know, SSP coordinator, who was just trying to be really, really creative about using what they, you know, using their, pulling whatever lever they had in terms of changing policies to make programs better and more effective, um, operate within this practice. Uh, health departments can play a really, really uh, amazing advocacy role there, lowercase advocacy, lowercase a advocacy there. Um, and, you know, like was mentioned on the other slide, this idea of community and shared purpose. Um, and I feel like this morning's panel with, with Michelle Mathis, I mean, she just really drove that point home so eloquently, really thinking about what is our sort of shared sense of community, how and how we approach this work. And what did she say, you know, this, uh, yeah, that, that there are just so many, so many ways that programs you know, and community really, and SSPs can play this role with, with, with community around, um, you know, humanizing people who use drugs and reducing stigma and uh, increasing the, the levels of humanity, um, you know, for this group that is often so heavily, heavily stigmatized, right? Um, and yeah, thinking about outreach, community engagement, different ways to approach that. All of this is covered um, in, in, I feel like I'm, well, I feel like I'm selling this thing, but um, all of that is covered uh, in, in this resource, right? So, oh, yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to highlight the one here, and I know that we're almost at time, so I want to be uh, very respectful of that. Um, but this program in Colorado um, did this thing that they call a good neighbor agreement, right? Um, and, and it was about trying to build support in communities and neighborhoods when they were looking for, um, to open their services, but also to, they had to relocate at a certain point in time. It was really challenging to find real estate 
with a lot of nimbyism going on, right? Um, so this person, the ED says, I believe very heavily in the good neighbor agreement. It's very awkward initially because you sit down with a mediator, law enforcement, some neighbors, and then you talk about what you're gonna do and how you're gonna do it. And then everybody signs off and then they allow you to just do it and implement it. Um, I like that because honestly, the good neighbor agreements are very nebulous, but people feel heard. And there's, there's something there, and I feel like some panelists this morning talked to it, spoke to this as well, is that part of, part of the, the role of someone running a program, working in a program, is also about meeting and building support, is also about meeting different community members and groups where they're at in terms of their comfort level and really making sure that they feel like they have a voice and are heard um, in terms of concerns and support. And um, building those relationships is really, really important in terms of overall stability. And then I lastly just want to highlight this amazing CDC fact sheet um, on needs-based distribution. And this was um, came out concurrently with um, the, the SSP technical package. Um, and this is, uh, this is a big deal. I don't know how else to say it. This is a big deal. Um, it is included in the technical package as one of the appendices. Um, but this is uh, it took a long time, I think, for the, the CDC, our CDC team who are supporting syringe access programs to get this through the clearance process. Um, and I'll just speak more, you know, thousand foot about this. It's taken, you know, decades in terms of building support at those at the federal level um, to, to really be recognizing the integral role, the just like vitally important central role of syringe access programs. Um, and I, again, I'm just like so, so grateful to, for this fact sheet, for all of the other resources they put out in the last few years, um, many years. And uh, again, really just so grateful to have had the opportunity to work with that team as well as our other um, authors on this uh, to, yeah, to really get this, this resource out in the world because I think there's so much utility um, and potential utility in, in how it can be used both at the program level and the policy level. Okay, Whew, sorry, all that was a lot. <laughs> um, and yes, Tim, thank you, 30 plus years in the making to get the CDC, okay, yes, and, and the CDC team is so, so helpful um, throughout this. Um, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing and just uh, try to catch up on the chat a little bit and see if there are any potential questions. Um, yeah. um, this is Amanda. Yeah. I hadn't seen any questions. There was uh, a lot of support. So if folks have questions, please go ahead and write them in the chat. Um, there was definitely a lot of support for uh, meaningfully involving people who use drugs and programs, not just uh, paying them in pizza. Um, couldn't agree Big more one. with that. <laughs> um, so just going through right now but mm -hmm. uh, yeah if folks have any questions you feel free to put them in the chat and we can get to those and there was also uh, a question about the slides um, mm -hmm. so we will be sending out the recording and the slides to folks who registered um, at some point <laughs> and I also um, one of the I'm I'm not going to call out um, my CDC partner on this but I will un unmute them just in case they, they feel like chatting. I'm trying to ask them to unmute themselves. I don't know if that's what I can Hi. Do. Hi. I don't know if you want to say anything. Um, everyone should meet Alice Asher, who uh, has really been a champion um, at the CDC for syringe access programs and this project in particular. And yeah. Thank you. I mean, I just, you know, sorry, you guys, I'm about to go out on a run. Um, but Laura, thank you, like you just for, you know, describing it so well. You know, I know that Really, it's this community that's informed it, um, and we're just really excited to have that CDC stamp on it because we know, I mean, that a lot of communities really need that to bring some of this back to their health departments, to their policymakers, and show that this isn't just like some community-based like ideas, but really this is codified, you know, across the board for what works. So, um, you know, again, Laura, you did a great job, so thank you. No, Alice, you did a great job. No, you know, this was a real team community effort. And I, I feel grateful, um, again, to the community and probably the, I didn't even count, but probably the 60, 70 people who reviewed, who contributed, who edited, who were patient as we tried to get this out the door. Um, and uh, 
yeah, it was, a, I mean, it's been, a, I think, a really great process. And I think also has internally at the CDC kind of continued a conversation to really, you know, better understand or increase their knowledge around what programs look like and can look like. And, um, and, and you know, I think that it's been really useful on, on a lot of different levels. So I'm grateful. The one, I guess, one other thing is that, you know, this came about because, you know, whether it was at a conference getting stopped in the hallways or on a call or through a technical assistance request, like we heard over and over that this was needed. Um, so keep asking us, keep telling us what's needed because yep. it lets us go to our leadership and just say, you know, this, we know the science is there. We know the communities are asking mm -hmm. for it. So it, it's what make, gets us the permission to put things like this out there too. That's real, great point. Um, and I mean, if there are no other questions, I know we have like two minutes left, but I will just say, I have already seen this be used both in public forums, um, in, in media, in reference um, for advocacy to, to get programs aligned with best practices. Um, if folks were in the first session, you heard Robin talk about some of um, the challenges, uh, current legislative session in West Virginia right now um, with a bill that really might shutter every program across the state if it passes as is. Um, and this was a resource we were able to get over to um, community stakeholders and they fed into community members, committee members, um, and I listened painstakingly to all of that testimony that was being brought up and literally this thing was cited probably 10 times. And it was so, it was like, I heard legislators who don't know what syringe access programs are saying, like, listen, I'm here, I'm holding something that says, the CDC says, this is best practices. We need to have secondary exchange. It needs to be needs-based. Um, and so I just, you know, I, I think that there's, that's like the tip of the iceberg, I think, for how uh, we can be creative in using, you know, in, in using this for policy and for programs, obviously, um, in terms of practice and implementation. So.